Howdy, folks. So today, I want to focus on learning a new design principle. Something called CQRS, which I've just learned about. Or rather, design pattern. There we go. Let's learn some more about it. I know nothing about this. I've been, you know, I've just heard about it and I'm saving it for now. So let's see how it goes. This looks complicated. Now I have an inkling that it might have something to do with uh, microservices and microservice architecture. I'm betting that's the case based on these overly complicated diagrams. Hmm? Uh huh. I see. So it looks like it has to do with uh, scaling in a microservice architecture. It looks like the, the whole idea here is, well, maybe not scaling precisely, but the idea being that you separate your uh, reads and your writes into separate um, microservices so that you can then scale them separately. Because as near as I can tell, the whole microservice architecture is, or the whole point of it is scaling, right? Like programmatically, it doesn't help anything to have a lot of extra programs out there. But when you're talking about like trying to set up and orchestrate um, a system, like, you know, um, like software as a service or something, like when you're trying to provide some sort of service to customers, now all of a sudden it makes sense that you would want to like okay well i want to scale this part but i don't care to scale this part like um something like that like for example you might you might have vastly different scales for your reading and your writing depending on how many people have access to reading like some workflows are just inherently um you know read heavy and some others are inherently write heavy so it makes sense to separate those so that then you know you as a developer don't have to know in advance which one needs which scale and it can just be scaled out by someone else um, while they're can I move this bar I think I can would it bother me less down here I think I think so I think it's gonna bother me a little bit less I'm using VNC to connect to my Windows computer um, and it's a bit um, I haven't tried it before, so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I think I understand a general idea of it. Command and query responsibility segregation. There we go. Okay, nail on the head. Perfect. So you want to separate responsibility of changing things and querying things. I think they just use command and query here so they can get the fancy acronym to work. Really, they just mean reading and writing, or rather writing and reading. RWRS doesn't is not quite as fancy, I agree. So I think that was probably a good choice. Separates read and update operations. There we go, read and update. Yep, they're basically admitting it there. I don't know if Microsoft came up with this terminology, but whoever whoever created that acronym really thought hard about which synonym of read and write would, would do the job. Okay, so implementing CQRS in your application can maximize performance, scalability, security. It creates flexibility to allow a system to better evolve over time. I question that. Um, well, I guess evolve in the sense of changing scale. I guess, okay, I never thought about security, but obviously performance is directly impacted by scalability. So if something unsca is unscalable, then the performance is set and can't be changed. So that makes sense. Um, prevents update commands from causing merge conflicts at the domain level. Now that's interesting. That one I need to think about. Um, let me think about this for a second. Update commands from causing merge conflicts. So the only way I could see that happening is if somehow the command model is doing something below the domain level. Like, like some part of the command part, like some part of this part of the pattern is kind of like straddling between the 
domain level and the data level, so then they're not... So that it's not, um... Yeah. You know what I mean, right? Oh, hang on, hang on. My, my camera box is wrong. I need to... I'm confused. I'm getting confused here. Let me, um... Fix that real quick. Oh, I can't do it for some reason. It's not letting me. Hang on, let me see if this will work. Let's go back to here and see if that works. No, I still can't. Okay, I'll just have to live with it. Yeah, there we go. Oopsie daisy. Okay, in traditional architectures, the same data model is used to query and update a database. Okay, that's simple and works well for basic CRUD. Becomes unwieldy in larger applications. In what way? On the read side, I mean, obviously everything is unwieldy in larger applications, but which problems are, do you, are you actually solving here? Uh, on the read side, the application may perform many different queries, returning DTOs with different shapes. Okay, object mapping can become complicated. On the Yes, it is. On the right side, the model may implement complex validation and business logic. As a result, you can end up with an overly complex model that does too much. Yes, I've, I've definitely dealt with this. It's frustrating. Like, it, yeah. it's less frustrating when you're just trying to get a job done. But when you're trying to set up the perfect API or trying to set things up well to where it... When you're trying to set up things as well as you possibly can, you run into a limitation here with using normal... Uh, DTOs and you know and models and all that. I don't I don't know what you call it. It's just a normal way of doing things. Read and write workloads are often asymmetrical. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Okay, different performance and scale requirements. I wonder how performance is separated from scale. I guess okay, okay I get it. I get it. So performance would be like the performance of each individual scale unit. Could be different. Like you might need, for example, for updates, you might you might not write it in such a way to allow multiple units. You might not be able to actually scale, but you might need a lot of performance. But the reads, hopefully you would write those in a way, at least the reads, in a way that you could have multiple scale up units and scale down. And so then those would need less performance per unit. Okay, so I can see why they're separating those two and why they're bothering to talk about them separately. Okay, it seems worthwhile. So, so this is making sense. Um, read and write workloads are often asymmetrical with very different performance and scale requirements. Yeah, okay, we said that. There is often a mismatch between... Now, again, this is... This doesn't actually provide any information that I see. Is this just showing off the normal way of doing things? Anyway, I don't see any, I don't see any particular benefit to the diagram. There is often a mismatch between the... I mean, I guess this is showing what they're not doing with CQRS. Like, here's the normal way of doing things. There is often a mismatch between the read and write representations of the data, such as additional columns or properties that must be updated correctly, even though they aren't required as part of an operation. Uh-huh. Um, okay, I think I get what this is saying. If you're reading back a DTO and you want to modify the DTO and then save the results, you know, on your front end, you want to you want to modify a DTO, but you don't really want to, you don't care about the, the rest of the model, the back end model, like, or I guess the domain model. Um, you have to write it in such a way that it, um, you have to, you may have to update properties that you don't actually care about on the domain model because they exist there, even though they're not in your DTO. So then I, I've run into this problem before where I'm trying to save off from a DTO and I then have to do a read first to get the rest of the model and then modify the result uh, before saving it back off. Modify the, sorry, so yeah, take the read in the DTO or re read in the domain model, the full domain model save over the values that are in the DTO over top of the corresponding values in the, DT in, in the domain model, and then 
and then make sure the entire thing is cohesive. Yeah, and that's really frustrating when you just want to update one portion of it. It's like, well, but I, my backend doesn't support it. And now should I have just separated these at the data layer and had different tables? Like, you know, you start wondering like, um, good. Uh, okay, we did an install. Let's, oh, I don't really cancel. I don't need that update. Uh, no. Sorry, running updates at the same time and probably a bad idea. Oops. Okay. The traditional approach can have a negative effect on performance. Uh, that's wrong. That should be a fact, but whatever. Due to load on the data. Well, actually, no. Take it back. It can affect performance negatively, creating a negative effect. Sorry. Okay, anyway, the traditional approach can have a negative effect on performance due to load on the data store and data access layer and the complexity of queries required to retrieve information. Yeah, well, I just talked about that. Um, managing security and permissions can become complex because each entity is subject to both read and write operations. Sure. I have to think about that one. Hmm. I don't think I've had to do anything that granular with security and with permissions. I, I don't think I've had to deal with that problem. So lucky me, I guess. CQRS separates read and writes into different models using commands to update data and queries to read data. So I, I think then I was wrong about this being something specific to microservice architecture, although I can see how it would be very beneficial there, like almost required. Like it would almost be required. Maybe it's, maybe it's completely required. Um, I can see uses for it beyond that, so that's good. Um, commands should be task-based rather than data-centric. Okay. That's interesting because now we're creating a separation here. Oh, only on the command side though, not the query side. So maybe queries stay data centric and commands become task centric. I mean that. I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about the consequences of that. Commands may be placed on a queue for asynchronous processing rather than being processed synchronously. I'm not seeing. Yes, they may, but I'm not seeing exactly how that's how that necessitates CQRS. Or maybe they're just saying we're avoiding several bad patterns that would prevent this. So we're like, we're explicitly allowing this. Not saying this is the only way to do it. Queries never modify the database. A query returns, because all you really need to, to do this is you need an ET, you know, you need like a, a DSL. You need a language just for describing the, the process you want to occur. And then you need to be able to you know, you need to be able to run them offline. You have to be able to support doing them at a different time than when you schedule them. When you add them to queue. When you queue them. Anyway, you need, you need to be able to deal with them happening at a different time, asynchronously, obviously. So your architecture needs to allow that as well as you just need a language to express it. So I don't see how that's really special, but I can see how CQRS in general is going to require like let's say rewriting a legacy application that's written this way um, completely rewriting it and so then while you're stripping everything out and getting all these other nice things you also get this for free because because this also would require um, maybe not a maybe not as aggressive as a rewrite of a rewrite but it would require certainly some rethinking of the existing logic and moving logic from one place to another and could probably get messy. So queries never modify the database. I, yeah, that's totally in the name. <laughs> Command to query. I mean, isn't that in the word query? But okay. I mean, I guess in SQL, like you have, you technically have queries that modify a database. I mean, I guess, I don't know. It's called structured query language. So some of those commands update and it's still called a query. So I guess that's something you still have to specify. 
but it should just always mean read-only. Anyway, a re query returns a DTO that does not encapsulate any domain knowledge. Now that one I have to think about, does not encapsulate any domain knowledge. I think what they mean is there's nothing hidden. Like you're not, there's nothing unseen, there's nothing behind the scenes that you can't see in, in the DTO. Like the DTO is not part of a larger domain object behind the scenes. I think that's what they mean. The models can then be isolated as shown in the following diagram. Although that's not an absolute requirement. Okay. Validation, commands, domain logic, persistence. Okay, that's interesting. The commands and the domain logic can be separated. I mean, to some extent they'd have to be because there's gonna be domain logic for queries as well. I'm not fully getting this. I'm gonna to have to come back to this. Okay, we have a read model and a write model. Which I guess live in our repository. Queries. I don't know why it has generated. But I don't understand why you could take a noun and then give more specific information about it that's a verb. That doesn't, that doesn't read well. I, I, I'm just not able to parse that. Um... Oh, unless queries is supposed to be a verb here. Having separate query and update models simplifies the design and implementation. Okay. However, one disadvantage is that it can't automatically be generated from a database schema using scaffolding mechanisms in ORM tools. Okay. You will be able to build your custom on top of the generated code. Okay, so you can still use generated code at that level, but that code is not going to do CQRS for you and you have to be wary with it. Okay, okay. For greater isolation, you can physically separate the read data from the write data. I mean, that's what I would do in an ideal world. You know, I mean, in an ideal world, I wouldn't use scaffolding mechanisms. I would just... <laughs> Hire someone smarter than me to write it for me. <laughs> In the ideal world, I would always hire someone smarter than me to write my code, right? That's uh, <laughs> so that might not be realistic. But anyway, my <laughs> In an ideal world, I would I would go ahead and, and separate the the data. Like I would want to separate at every level the read from the write as far down as I could down to the level of the database. Okay, um, at least, I, I guess I at least want to have them in separate methods. Um, I'm not sure about separating the models, though, how that's going to work. At, uh, yeah, I need to look at the details. Okay. Anyway, in that case, the read database can use its own data schema that's optimized for queries. Oh, this is talking about completely separate databases. Oh. Okay, it can store a materialized view of the data. When they said physically separate, I thought they meant physically separate code, but they mean like literally shoop, separate servers. For example, it can store a materialized view of the data in order to avoid complex joins or complex form mappings. Basically the same thing you would do for, um, the th same thing you would do for reporting. It might even use a different type of data store. For example, the write database might be relational while the read database is a document database. If separate read and write databases are used, they must be kept in sync, usually accomplished by having the write model publish an event whenever they face the database. Okay. Since message brokers and databases usually cannot be enlisted into a single transaction, there can be challenges in guaranteeing consistency when updating the database and publishing events. Yeah, that would be a problem. I mean, you can take multiple databases and put them in a single transaction. I think what I would want to do in that case, if I really needed transactional, like if I really needed to guarantee consistency and I still wanted to keep separate databases, I think what I would do there is I would have the command, where does it say this? The write model, right? I would have it actually, instead of updating the database directly, the write database, I would have it just send off the 
command to update the database. And then you would have the event layer, like the event receiver would have to modify both databases inside the transaction. That's the only way I can see to do that. That's not exactly separate, but it's also not exactly not. You could keep a semantic separation there and still have it the same transaction. I think that would be fine. It'd be a little obtuse, but I mean, if that's what you need, that's what you do. Mm, okay, for more information, see this. I'm not interested. Okay, so what's this mean compared to this? These, these, uh, like none of these images have labels. This one at least describes what's going on there. It should have captions. Okay, so presentation, validation, da da. Oh, okay, I got it. Still haven't figured out that syntax there. The read store can be a read-only replica of the write store, or the read and write stores can have a different structure altogether. Using multiple read-only replicas can increase query performance. Yes. And... Okay, I could see that being a thing. Oh yeah, I'm... Yeah, I'm, you can almost guarantee that um, companies like YouTube, or, or like products like YouTube, do that. YouTube and um, probably even Google search, like things like like counts on YouTube um, are known to be laggy. Like they're not updated immediately because like at the end of the day, who cares? You know, like it, it literally does not matter who liked in what order, right? The only thing that really matters is the total number of likes. And that's something you can resolve offline. You don't have to you don't have to sequence like the act, the individual events of two people liking something, right? You don't have to sequence them in order and try to line them up globally. You just have to count them and add them together. You can just aggregate them. So since they can be aggregated that way and there's no no ordering uh, dependency there, you know, the like count that you get for a video might be different than the one someone else gets because it might only show likes that are local to you until they've been sent out, like for, for a few minutes, let's say the page you load, or probably just a few seconds, honestly, the page you load might show a different like count than what's known globally or what's shown in another region because only likes from your region have been shown to you and other likes are, are pending transfer from a different region. That sounded more complicated than necessary, but anyway, the point is on YouTube, likes are, are written in a similar way. Like they're, they're distributed this way where the reading and the updating are are not necessarily happening in the same region. Like you, the, the data you read could be out of date. Anyway, you can bet that's used a lot by probably for Facebook posts and even Twitter posts, things like that. Those probably are published in a similar way. Okay. Anyway, separation of the read and write stores also allows each to be scaled appropriately to match the load. For example, read stores typically encounter a much higher load than write stores. I said that, okay. Some implementations use the event sourcing pattern. I'm gonna just take a brief look at that one. With this pattern, application state is stored as a, yeah, let's not. I just want a picture. Okay, their pictures are not, are questionable. UI, okay. Command query, I, they're mentioning CQR, QRS, I see. So I guess this works for either. Okay, the command or query bus. Command service. Query service. Okay. Event store. And the backend. Okay, so it looks like this is just a a system for persisting stuff. And it, it, it looks like what this enables you to do is to save things offline. Like you save things here and then push them there when you get the chance. But also, 
when someone does a query to the backend source, um, if it's handled by the same uh, same system, the same process, it has the chance, if, it, if you want to, it ha you have the chance to update the queries coming from the back end to match the latest updates that are planned for them before you show them in the UI. And that may be optimistic because something could always fail on this layer. But you could get pretty sophisticated with what you want to show the user. And like, theoretically, you could show the user the most up-to-date information even if it hasn't fully processed yet. I don't know if that's the intended benefit of that pattern, but instead of storing just the current state of the data in the domain, use an append-only store to record the full series of actions taken on the data. Okay. Store acts as a system of record and can be used to materialize domain objects. Oh. So basically what I said is the whole point. Like, these would be your baseline objects, right? And then you modify them using all the commands that are in the in the bus, yeah, okay. This can simplify tasks in complex domains by avoiding the need to synchronize the data model in the business domain. By avoiding the need to synchronize the data model in the business domain, while perf improving performance, scalability, responsiveness, consistency for transactional data, and maintain full audit trails and history that can be in that can enable compensating actions. Mm hmm So it can also provide consistency. Why do you need it to provide consistency? Where do you lose it? I mean, obviously, any relation, any good relational database is going to allow, is going to enable consistency. But it's a different way of storing domain objects. It's kind of the way Git stores. Well, no, Git doesn't do this, but some some source control systems store original files, and then this. Well, actually, they store a series of patches, a series of diffs, and they reconstruct the latest version of the file or whichever one you check out by applying those diffs in order from the beginning of time to the end. Git doesn't do that. Um, at least um, nominally it doesn't, but it actually does do it in, it, in the way it stores, uh, um, what do they call it again? The pack files actually do that um, for, for compress, like it compresses things into pack files, which, which do that to some extent. But the nominally, and you can always think of Git like when you're thinking about Git, you can always think of it as storing things in like the traditional way, just storing the actual domain objects, um, the, the commit objects in the case of Git. Um, but it has the option to store the diffs instead. Okay, so I think that's as much as I need to know about that pattern to continue. <laughs> Some implementations use the event sourcing pattern, which enables application state to be stored as a sequence of events. Okay, the current state is constructed by replaying the events. One benefit is that the same events can be used to notify other components. Oh, okay, that makes sense. You can replay the events in multiple places. Yeah. In particular, to notify the read model. So then you have, basically, you can have the read store and the write store be more or less independent. You replay the... The write store, I guess, would just be your log of appends. And then your read store could like uh, reify those objects. It could construct the final form, the domain objects, and just store them directly. Because it's it's the read-only side, so who cares? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, the read model uses the events to create a snapshot of the current state. You know what I just said. Okay. Which is more efficient for queries. Yes. However, event sourcing adds complexity to design. You betcha it does. I'm... I think the benefits of event sourcing is are kind of subtle. And it has a lot of downsides. Like, you have to re-architect a lot of things. I mean, if you have a team that's 
capable and you have enough bandwidth for it, like you can basically just, I mean, effectively what you're doing is you're building your own database system with event sourcing. And it even shows in that image I was looking at, it even shows an event source store. So it's effectively a database. I guess this is projected onto the relational database. So all that stuff I said about um, modifying the query or the, the domain the domain model from the query based on the upcoming events, upcoming mutation events, that thing probably wouldn't happen in most cases. But actually, it would be happening like like whatever the, the whatever the accepted current state is would be projected into a domain model here. Okay, I'm getting it. I'm starting to understand this. So this this relational database is used only for the query service, and this event store is homebrew or specialized for the purpose. Um, event event source database. Are there any? Yeah, okay, there are some already. Event store DB. Okay, so it looks like this company offers an open source option. Store the Y of your data, stream the rest. Mm hmm. I, I'm kind of wondering what the main benefits are because there are a lot of downsides. I, get, I guess you don't have to build your own database now because you can just use this one. Store your data as an immutable series of events. Sure. Okay, fine, I'm not needing that. Um, I clicked on, didn't I just click on see the benefits? I didn't, I don't see any benefits there. Features and benefits, none, okay. Oh, here we go, features, benefits. I'm not seeing benefits anywhere, so I think that this could be worded better. Because I don't care about the features. I, I only care about the features once I've decided to use this architecture. Okay, well, anyway, let's look at the features, see if we can surmise the benefits. Guaranteed rights? Well, I mean, re relational database gives me that. Um, rights are committed to a disk, which makes it ideal for a source of record database. I guess the idea here is that your events are guaranteed to be written. High availability? Well, okay, but a database also gives me, like a normal relational database gives me that as well. Projections allow you to react to events as they are written and to create new events when interesting combinations occur. But if I have a normal relational database, I don't need this. So, there are client SDKs based on, I do like that they use the word projection though. Like that's, that's very intuitive. Okay. Um, Cause effectively what you're doing is you're just taking your base domain model and you're mutating it. And of course, in say a, going back to the version control example, like your domain model, you know, like if you imagine a version control system as a series of um, patches to a single file, let's say, just for simplicity. If you imagine a series of commits as being a series of patches to a file or a series of diffs to a file, the first diff would be from an empty file to whatever the initial contents are. So you just apply that patch to a brand new file that's been truncated or you know is empty um, and then you have your your after applying your first per projection you now have a file that means something to you um, but before that you have nothing you don't even have an empty file because the empty file is kind of assumed when you're adding a new diff a, a diff to a new file yeah at least in get which again doesn't use this model at least in get the new files assumed in in the in the way diffs display so then you just project from nothing to whatever model you want and you keep going okay yeah no, I, I like i like that they're calling that a projection is basically a mutation i suppose one difference is you're mutating but you're not overriding the original so it's a mutation to an immutable object anyway um, optimistic concurrency checks. Um, okay. This seems like a product version. It has nothing to do with the, 
theoretical thing. Great performance at scales, that's again, not not anything to do with the theory. Immutable data store. Um Yeah, okay, strongest auto log logs available. I do like this actually. Like I personally find this very appealing and satisfying. But my personal feelings wouldn't govern my choice of data store. So I <laughs> I think they're underselling it by quite a bit. Like they're saying, why use event store for event source or event store DB for event sourcing? Okay, I think that's a, I think they make a pretty compelling case for that, but they haven't talked me into using event sourcing at all, which I think the benefits would speak to. Um, benefits. Here we go. Benefits. Time travel. Yeah, this is like a time machine on the Mac OS. Fault tolerance. Um, I guess if you if you write a new event that breaks a domain model, you can just delete it and then rebuild the domain model from it. I, I you know what? I, okay, I'm I'm starting to like this event driven architecture. Hmm. Okay. I don't really buy that this necessarily makes things more efficient. Or to say it another way, like if you don't use event-driven architecture and you need efficiency, you will still um, find it. The question is, is it better than the alternative? And they're not offering an alternative, so I don't really know. And I personally, I, I don't, I'm not really seeing the I don't know. It's, it's hard. Events events are hard. <laughs> I have to really get my mind into it when I want to start thinking about events. Event source systems strive for the minimum amount of synchronous interaction. Consistency boundaries are consciously chosen so that business requirements are met. And everything else is eventually consistent. This results in responsive High performance scalable system. So this part of being able to choose your consistency boundary or being forced to choose your consistency boundary up front, I can see a huge benefit to that. Like anything that forces the the architect to think about things in advance. Um, especially when the first especially when the architect of a project is just the first programmer to start working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything that forces you to think about things sooner probably a good thing um service autonomy or at least I, I i mean you don't necessarily have to think through every, every part of your design meticulously in advance but you need to be able to answer the question is it important to to think this through now you need to at least think that far into the, something so you know service autonomy like what what's the worst case scenario if i put this off put off this design decision till later and that way, you know, you can have a design that grows as you start implementing it instead of having to, you know, do waterfall method and just finish design first. But you still need to be able to ask those questions like, where do I need my API boundary? Where do I need my, yeah, where do I need, which things need to be consistent with what? Uh, service autonomy. Okay, this is basically just describing queuing up events. If a service goes down, dependent events can catch up and the source comes back up. That's just how events work. It's event queues. So event sourcing is beyond that. So what's the additional whatever? Because events are stored in a sequence in the stream, synchronization can be achieved when each service is back online. I think this part is really where you go from just a normal event queue to uh, event sourcing because, because you rely on the event queue as you're as your source of record, you know that once your queue is caught back up, everything's synced. And you don't have to worry about, oh no, um, I have this relational database I've been modifying, and on top of that, I have these events that are backed up. How do I keep those two consistent? Okay, replay and shape. Yep, well, this is just another way of, that's another way of rephrasing fault tolerance or to say it another way replay and reshape 
allows the fault tolerance. Yeah, I love I love this. I mean, I do rebasing all the time and get so that one. Yeah. In an event source system, events flow through queries and streams, allowing for lots of observ observability. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really, I don't have enough context to really get that quickly. I have to think about it. Okay, so, yeah, okay, you can you can change how frequently things are connected. Yep, yep, so you can have, for example, you could have, going back to this model here, maybe your query database, your, your read-only query database is synced once a year because the queries are be doing are being or maybe once every three months because the maybe the queries are being performed by the Mars rover and you know you don't really need updates all that often or something or vice versa where you have a distant something distant in the solar system which is updating as often as it can sending back events as often as it can yeah okay Okay, so I'm seeing the benefits of this. Kind of like that uh, that long-range IP. I can't remember the name of the protocol. Anyway, there's a protocol specifically designed for um, when you're sending a message and it could take multiple light seconds or even a light di a light minute to send a message. You know, redesigning TCP or, or rather IP to work over long scales and also to work with buffering and stuff. Anyway, so that, that kind of seems like a a sister technology. Okay. Okay, okay. Independent scaling, which I've been talking about the whole time, may result in fewer lock contentions. Okay, so they're not promising you that, but they're saying that that might just happen. I'm not going to argue with it. Optimized data schemas. The read side can use a schema that's optimized for queries, while the right side uses a schema that's optimized for updates. Okay. Oh, well, music went away. What happened? Let's go check on that. There we go. YouTube gave up on me. Okay. Anyway. Implementation issues and considerations. Oh, let's go back here. So uh, this one has me concerned, actually. The fact that the read and write side are completely different all the way down to the data level, that that concerns me. I'm thinking, I was thinking at first, like what, when would you ever, like event sourcing sounds really nice, but it has all these extra implications that you have to deal with. Um, but now I'm thinking that might be the easiest way to do it for CQRS. That might be the easiest way to implement CQRS. And I can understand why they'd be used in conjunction. It's easier to ensure that only the right domain entities are performing writes on the data. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Separation of concerns. Because effectively what you're doing is you're making your models more granular. And even your, like you're separating your reads and your writes effectively into separate applications. So that automatically is more granular, especially from, a, from an ops perspective. Um, segregation. Separating the read and write can result in models that are more maintainable and flexible. Yeah, we talked about that. Most of the complex business logic goes into the write model. The read model can be relatively simple. Yeah. I mean, if anything, the only part about reading that's ever complicated is sometimes you have a view model that that you want to tweak a little bit. Um, by storing a materialized view in the read database, the application can avoid complex joins when querying. Hmm. Um. Um. Okay, you're right, because we were talking about effectively, what is it called? Third normal form. It, effectively, it's going to a lower normal form in the relation. Well, well, that only applies to relational databases. That's why they didn't bother using it. Because it, because the read, yeah. Yeah, basically the same benefit happens when you're creating a data warehouse for reporting. You get the advantage of, hey, no joins, just 
everything joined the way you need it. Okay. Concerns. Complexity. The basic idea of CQRS is simple. I would argue with that. I, I, no, it's not simple. It can lead to a com more complex application design, especially if, if they include the event sourcing pattern, especially if it includes the event sourcing pattern. Yeah, they there doesn't make sense. Anyway, messaging. Although CQRS does not require messaging, it's common to use messaging to process commands. In that case, the application must handle messages, message failures, or duplicate messages. Okay, uh, priority queues, I assume this is... Oh, it's a pattern, okay. Eventual consistency. If you separate the read and write databases, the read, mod read data may be stale, which is not appropriate for all, all domains. Like, yeah. The read model store must be updated to reflect changes to the write model store, and it can be difficult to detect when a user has issued a request based on stale read data. must be updated to reflect changes to the right model store. Mm -hmm. I think they're I think they're repeating themselves so much it's getting hard for me to, to really understand because my issue right now. The read model store must be reflect updated to reflect changes to the right model store and it can be difficult to detect when a user has request issued a request based on stale Read data. I really don't understand the context enough to really get what they're saying, but I get the overall concern. Like the read data is going to be stale. You have to deal with eventual consistency. It's a fact of life. Like you then have to re, like your UI has to be redesigned to take that into account potentially because you have to communicate to the user, hey, this data may or may not be the latest especially if it's like critical data that just has to be right. You have to have some, like for some critical data, you, you would have to have some sort of way to refresh it and guarantee you're looking at the latest. Um, consider CQRS for the following scenarios. Now this is interesting because I saw CQRS in a job application. There's a job description I was reading and that tends to make me think that their that job was probably falling under one of these like the code they're working with in that job description on that team is probably falling under one of these scenarios i mean maybe they have come up with some clever extra scenario but more than likely it's gonna be one of these um, big easy ones collaborative collaborative domains where many users access the same data in parallel okay um, right, it allows you to scale. Define commands with enough granularity to minimize merge conflicts at domain level. And conflicts that do arise can be merged by the command. Okay, I think I'm getting that. Yeah. Like for example, if you're making a booking system, uh, task, yeah, let's say you're Booking hotel rooms, you're making your own booking system. Um, you don't have to modify the entire reservation, right? You're just, you have a command, you have a command saying, okay, um, maybe you want to confirm your reservation, right? So then you say, okay, let's, let's take that booking, let's take that reservation we have and let's um, mark it as confirmed or I guess reserved. This is kind of presupposing that when you're booking, when the per, when a customer is in the process of booking a hotel room, they're going to create a reservation, and then later, during the process, like after ending the credit card and the credit card goes through and everything, later it actually gets marked as reserved. Um, okay, so they created like a a pending reservation, I guess. So then you could be modifying, like six, for example. You know, you could have someone on the back end modifying various properties around the reservation, right? And then the user might cancel the reservation. And those could go through at the same time. And yeah. Because, because they're not both trying to lock the same fields. 
there's no conflict there at least semantically there's no conflict now whether or not whether or not you're storing this data in a way that allows you to recognize that granularity like there's granularity in this in the semantics but but whether or not that granularity follows through to the way you're storing the data is another question altogether like you might still have to lock a whole row to make a change in a relational database for example event sourcing would take care of that but but you know they event sourcing isn't required so yeah okay got it it minimizes merge conflicts and conflicts that do arise can be merged by the command yes the reason they can be is because basically if you separate your commands into tasks different tasks then any conflict that arises is within the domain of that particular command uh, that particular particular task like if no you know if you have a task to cancel a reservation let's say the only particular the only potential conflict, at least semantically, is on the, you know, reservation status flag. And so the, the, um, the system is going to know what to do with that. And, and in particular, the part of the system responsible for canceling a reservation is going to know what to do with that. Because let's say there's a conflict where, um, you know, let's say there's a delay between the time when the reservation, when the user finishes filling out the form and puts in the credit card information and the time when the um, reservation is actually reserved, right? Let's say there's a delay there for whatever reason. Maybe the uh, company elects to verify the customer's credit card information offline and to play, you know, maybe they need a deposit or, or a hold on the, on the account and they do that offline and that takes time. And let's say in the meantime, the user changes their mind, finds a better deal or whatever. They go to cancel the reservation. Now you potentially you have a, a potential conflict scenario because you have one system is trying to say, okay, this reservation has been confirmed, right? We've got the hold on the account. We have everything we need. This is a real reservation. And at the same time, the user is trying to cancel. Well, it's very immediately obvious what to do in that scenario. Let the cancellation go through and blow away the other status. Um, of the other status change. It's, it's immediately obvious what needs to happen there. And it only involves that one part of the system. So it can all be self-contained in one module that that only has to care about reservation status changes. Like maybe you have several statuses like, um, um, like the initial status would be like, um, I don't know, temporary or something like that. And then you'd have a status of, okay, um, pending. Right, that mean we're, relate, we're waiting for the backend system to finish, and then you might have another status of reserved and another one of canceled, right? So then you have maybe four tasks for that, um, and each one is going to understand what to do. Yeah, okay, and how to resolve conflicts because they only can have conflicts on the part it cares about. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm getting that. That's that's tricky though. I, I don't know if what I said, all everything I said is definitely true it's just that seems to be the case that seems to be what they're implying task-based user interfaces where users are guided through a complex process as a series of steps or with complex domain models oh, okay i think i'm getting this i think i'm getting this basically when you design a ui and you want to have a wizard workflow we do one task at a time to complete it you actually have a very easy way to save all that to your back end so the UI doesn't have to store it as state. Like the UI doesn't have to store that state. It just becomes part of the um, the backend um, data. So, so yeah, okay. That makes sense. So, so basically your user actions that are intuitive map directly onto this. Hey, what do you know? You know, user actions that are intuitive map on the developer actions that are intuitive. Like that does that. That doesn't seem entirely accidental since most developers are also people, you know, like <laughs> users and developers are also people. So <laughs> the same thing that fits into a developer brain on one level fits into a user brain on another level of abstraction. Um, okay. Task based. The right model has a full command processing stack with business logic. 
input validation and business validation. The right model may treat a set of associated objects as a single unit for data changes. Um, and ensure these objects are always in a consistent state. The read model has no business logic or validation stack and just returns a DTO for use in a view model. The read model is eventually consistent with the write model. Hmm. I wonder if TurboTax uses this in the back end. Maybe. But they don't have to. I mean, this is just a, this is an application of the pattern. And if you have a pattern, you don't necessarily have to use CQRS because you might not know about it. Or you might accidentally use it without realizing it. That's probably worse. Scenarios where performance of data reads must be fine-tuned separately from performance of data writes. Yeah, that that's obvious, yeah. Especially the number of reads is much greater than the number of writes. Now, I wonder why it's it's not saying the, the other scenario, like if the number of writes are much greater than the number of reads. Oh, I know why. Because the eventual consistency. This isn't really as appropriate for write-heavy workloads because of eventual consistency. The read model isn't guaranteed to be up-to-date. So CQRS is not necessarily the best option then. Okay. In this scenario, you can scale out the read model, but the write model, run the write model in just a few instances. A small number of write model instances also helps minimize the occurrence of merge conflicts. Makes sense. Scenarios where one team of developers can focus on the complex domain model that is part of the write model, and another team can focus on the read model and the user interface. This is good, yeah. This is very good. Yeah, yeah. Scenarios where the system is expected to evolve over time and might contain multiple versions of the model or where business rules change regularly. Um, integration with other systems, especially in combination with event sourcing, where the temporal failure of one subsystem shouldn't affect the availability of the others. Okay. I don't know what they mean by temporal. I mean, they could have just said temporary if that's what they meant. I feel like they mean like a rift in space time. <laughs> Maybe they're talking about <laughs> the, head, the anatomy of the head. Okay. Temporal cause. Oh. Basically, any kind of timing failure, not just temporarily unavailable. So not just like complete failure of the system for a temporary amount of time, but any sort of timing related issue. So a timing ish, um, failure of one system shouldn't affect the availability of others. Okay. It's not recommended when the domain or business rules are simple. Yeah, and you know why? Because CQRS is not simple. Like if you don't already have the, like if the complexity of this pattern is not already present in your domain, it might not be the best option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it is present in your domain, you may as well do it the same way someone else said was a good idea. <laughs> Isn't that the whole idea behind domain pattern or, or design patterns? Match your design to the domain so that um, you're, you're expressing the domain com domain's complexity in the most optimized way you can, the you know, most optimized way we know of. Is it recommended for simple CRUD style user interface and data access operation? Oh, when the simple things are sufficient. So it's basically saying only complex stuff. Consider applying CQRS to limited sections of your system where it will be most valuable. Okay. Okay. I might look at this in a minute, but I don't think I need to so much. I was thinking about maybe um, developing an application to, to show this, just to kind of get it. But honestly, like, it, it's, 
it's really going to modify every aspect of a program, so it may not even be... I don't know, maybe it needs to congeal my brain longer. Yeah. Let's look at this example. The following code shows some extracts from an example of a CQRS implementation that uses different definitions for the read and write models, which I feel like we're repeating. Okay, the model interfaces don't dictate any features of the underlying data stores. Hmm. The model interfaces don't dictate any features of the underlying data stores. <sighs> I think that's a really high level statement. <laughs> And they can evolve and be fine-tuned independently because these interfaces are separated. Okay, the following code shows the read model definition. Product DSO, no oh, DAO, product DAO. Display, there, I can see code. I collection, find my name, find out the stock products, find related products, find by ID, okay. Product display, bunch of stuff, product inventory, ID name out of stock. Now where is this used? ID name current stock, okay, so it doesn't give you the full object again, it just gives you a summary object. And you have the ID, so you can find my ID if you care. And you have basically just enough information to show to the user. Okay. This system allows users to rate products. Well, enough information to show to the user and to query for more details. Okay. The system allows users to rate products. The application does, does this using the rate product command shown in the following code. I command interface. Interesting. Interesting that the com I command interface only has a getter. Like it only it doesn't have any sort of writing. Uh, the interface doesn't describe writing anything or updating anything. Rate product is an I command. Um, this ID equals new GUID. Okay. ID, get set, product ID, get set, rating. Hmm. It's starting to bug me. The system uses the command, the product command handler class to handle component commands sent by the application. Okay. Command sent by the application. Um, okay, they're not really saying anything there. Clients typically send commands to the domain through a messaging system such as a queue. I mean, they're not saying anything really we haven't read already. Like, we haven't inferred from reading it. Um, this is more or less a rephrasing of... You, you, could, you could equally... S oh, wait, never mind. Products command handler. Sorry, I misunderstood. I... Okay. Got it. So I was inserting this class name here without reading it. Okay. <laughs> now it makes more sense. Okay. These commands are sent through this. Okay, and every command has an ID. Got it. So I command is not the command handler. It is just a command. Okay. And every command would need a separate ID. Presumably that's to separate it from other. Presumably that allows you to separate the. Um, uh, presumably the ID is used to distinguish rate commands from other types of commands. Well, no, because it's not set statically. It's set in the constructor. So it. It doesn't do that. Um, my question is, how do you know what to do with this model when it gets in the queue? 
how do you distinguish it from other types of commands? Like there's a rate command, what if there's a restock command or a remove command, like maybe a product's discontinued. And then again, I'm not thinking about just the, just the cut, like, like there could be a front end customer and there could also be a back end, like a, a, an admin uh, user. They have different commands available to them. Okay, so. Um, clients typically send commands to domain through a messaging system such as a queue. The command handler accepts these commands and invokes methods of the domain interface. The granularity of each command is designed to reduce the chance of conflicting requests, so you specifically limit the data you care about. The following code shows an outline of the product command handler class. An outline, so it doesn't show everything. Okay. You have a repository, a product repository, and now we haven't seen yet Yes, we have not yet seen the product class. So everything we've seen is a smaller subset of the of the objects in there. Okay, excuse me. Okay. So. Great, got a repository, um, add new product, handle. Oh, this is how we're doing it. This is a really dumb way to do it. I don't think having a bunch of overlets do this is, is a very effect. Like, I think this is harder to read as a developer. I would rather you just passed in an I command here and then, and then actually dispatched it by hand because like with a switch statement or something based on the class. And I know that like this might be perform better, but I think this is just really hard to read. Yeah, and it's really hard to tell which ones you have and which ones you don't. Like I think this should be, I don't think this is a very good dispatch technique, Ugh, but that's not what they're trying to demonstrate. So, okay, we what we see, we have the add new product command, the rate product, add the inventory, but that's effectively a restock. Confirm item shipped, update stock from inventory recount. Okay, I guess this one probably updates multiple products. Um, rate product, okay. Repository.find. Find the command by product ID. Did we mention the repository earlier? No, we didn't define it, okay. Find by product ID. No, we didn't. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So. My YouTube is wrong. Just notice that. I am going to fix it. Um, uh, not much I can do about it. Yep, not much I can do about it. I realize that now that every time it switches songs, it's going to get messed up, so... Maybe I can fiddle with it later and get it working, but... Oh well. Um... Product is repository.find, command, product ID, blah, blah, blah. Find the product. If it's not null, rate. Oh, my mind's just a mush now after reading this so long. Rate the product. You need a user ID and a rating. So we pull in the whole object and we perform an action on it. Pull in the whole product model. Perform an action, rate product. This is nice and short and sweet at least. But I'm not seeing any sort of conflict resolution here. So that's concerning. I mean, rate product might not... Well, I mean, it actually might need it because if you have the same user ID bringing in two different ratings, you would need to know which one was performed chronologically last. So there's an ordering constraint here. 
that's not really being honored in this example code. This would have been a great chance for them to show off the conflict resolution stuff. Okay. <laughs> Next steps, worry about data consistency. Okay, so I, I think I'm done with that for now. Although, to be honest, this isn't, okay, this isn't really showing me the part that I'm, con that, like this shows the idea, right? Which is all good. But it doesn't show the specific thing I'm worried about. Like, it doesn't really show concretely what's going on here behind the scenes. Yeah, it shows how commands are separated from... It shows how the, D, the, read, the read DTOs are separated from the command effectively DTOs. Just going in the other direction. Um, so it shows how the DTOs are separated. But it doesn't show anything about like actually resolving conflicts or doing any of the stuff that matters. It's like what we've got here are basically just separate separate classes. Like like and the thing that's frustrating me about this a little bit is we have this product object here. And presumably this product class is also used to construct the read DTOs, right? This product display and product inventory. So what are we showing that's different? I mean, everything about this, it's different. Everything about the CQRS that's actually legitimately different other than just refactoring and separating, separating um, portions of your old existing service classes into new ones. Everything about it that's different and good is hidden here inside this rate product command. So I'm bummed out because I don't feel like this is actually an example of CQRS. This is just a bunch of boilerplate boilerplate that's necessary for it, but it doesn't actually exemplify the concept. And and not very well, I might add, because this whole idea here, that every command has to be processed in the same file, I, I don't like that. I get that this is simplified to work as, a, as an example. Oh, okay, I'm getting it. I command handler, okay, okay. I'm feeling a little bit better now about the handle methods because we're implementing this interface and we're implementing multiple. Okay, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit better about the whole dispatch thing because these could be in separate classes. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling a lot better about it actually. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because you could set it up to have a list of separate classes that handle different I commands. A bunch of I command handler classes and then just pull the one that matches the um, object you're working with, the command you have. Um, still, I think, I think that the example here does not what the code that I'm seeing does not require me to honor CQRS. Like writing this code, I could then go and write the rate product um, command effectively, because all of this is boilerplate to get the command to actually happen. The, the way this command is written is really what's key here. I mean, yeah, the, the organization is, is relevant to trying to get your mind in the right space, but honestly, all of this organization here, everything they have is specific to an application I don't care about. Everything they have is not CQRS, exactly not CQRS. They're just showing me all the boilerplate necessary for a specific domain that I don't actually care about. So the implementation of this rate products is really what it's gonna show me the good stuff. Like, how do you write rate product in such a way that it can have a lock on product or it can avoid merge conflicts 
I guess it doesn't necessarily need a lock. It just needs to check. Okay, for the system as it exists now. User ID, rating, um, product ID, as it exists now, let's say that the, that the user can only rate a product once, right? So then you, if you see an existing rating for the same user ID, you just say, nope, take the, take the first one, take the one that's already saved. Um, but really what I'd want to see is a timestamp here. And the timestamp comes from the client application or even from the, from the web API that receives a request um, from the client application. And then at that point, it's like, okay, I've got a timestamp. I'm going to attach this timestamp. And then whichever one happened last, that's the one we should keep. And then it would automatically, every data store would always be updated to the latest eventually. So they missed a chance to show me how to actually use the CQRS. Like, I, I feel like they did everything except show me how to use it. That's frustrating. Yeah. Okay, well, that's enough for now. I, I'm not going to try to drill into this right now and, and try to understand this better. And I'm not going to try to write an application that uses CQRS, although I can see here, based on that example, it's not as complicated as I was thinking. At least for the most part. What I would have to do, I think, is say start from this example, write the rate product command, and then verify that it doesn't verify that it doesn't um, violate any of the principles of CQRS. That's what I have to do. But I don't think an application that makes use of the code they provided necessarily avoids violating the CQRS principles or the design pattern even for this one command that they've implemented a wrapper for. Because really this is just a wrapper around the command. It doesn't actually do any commandy things. It just wraps the wraps the functionality that should be this is the part that needs to respect CQRS to, to some extent. I mean, I, I, I'm being too harsh on them. They, they have separated out the reads and the writes. But the consistency guarantees in the um, conflict management happens inside here. I guess it's okay. Eh, whatever. Okay, so this was worthwhile. I learned a lot. Let me go look at these images again. What is this? Oh, okay, I get it. I get it right here. We have, I bet that's some Apache product. Um, rewrite to our event store or whatever. We project to the read side database. And then we query, okay, yeah. I guess this, when you look at it this way, when you look at the, this is sort of a cross section of the architecture. It does look simple from this perspective. So let's look at another one. I wish these would just be bigger. Anyway. Okay. This one's a little more traditional. On the data side, anyway. I guess these are supposed to be models or DTOs of the same of the same domain model. I I don't know. I'm not really seeing a lot of intelligibility there in that graphic. I mean, I think this would have been just as intelligible. Here's a here's a copy of it. I think it would have been just as intelligible if you left off everything inside here except the label. I think it would have given the same amount of information. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, this this helps. Write models, read models. It's, this leaves less to be desired. I, I think it's decent.
Okay. Okay, well, there's that. And uh, yeah, now I've learned this design pattern. I should be able to talk about it well, and I should be able to implement it. So it, it, it looks exciting. And uh, yeah. Woohoo.